Once again today we greet you in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We appreciate you being here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to get this hour coming up. We hope we can be an inspiration to everyone. And we want you to pray for us as this hour moves by that God will use the singing as well as the preaching of his word. I want you to take your Bible and turn, will you please, to Job chapter 38. It's page 594 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. After you turn there, turn to Colossians chapter 3, which is page 1265. I have here in my hand my book number 2, Bible questions and answers everyone should know. And on page uh, five of this book, you have these questions answered. What man in the Bible was cursed or cured by a fig poultice? Where is it implied in the Bible that a horse laughed? Does it say in the Bible that Christ was crucified on a dogwood tree? What woman in the Bible, the more she spent on doctor bills, the worse she became? What is the meaning of the scripture where it says, If a man behaveth himself uncommonly toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. And then where is the scripture that describes what Jesus looked like? Where does it say ten women will bake bread in one oven? What two men did God kill for offering strange fire before him? Where is the scripture that tells a woman how to win her husband to Christ? What man said to another, you will be eyes to me, you will be to me as eyes. Then where does the Bible say that the wind blew quail from the sea? What people in the Bible accuse themselves looking like grasshoppers? Is there a woman in the Bible by the name of Noah? Do you have scripture in the Bible for laying on of hands on people for ordaining them for leadership or special services? These questions you find answered on page five of book number two. Now, if you'd like to have this book, just write in and enclose a gift of two dollars or more and request the book. We'll get it right in the mail to you. We have five of these books. If you'd like to have all five, each one has 150 Bible questions and answers. If you'd like to have all five of these books, then uh, you might send in a gift of $10 or more, and we'll send you the book. I want you to pray for me and write to me. I always stand in need of those that love God to work with me in getting out the gospel. So I'd like to hear from you this week. This is a faith ministry, and you can have a part in this ministry. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. If you'd like to have a list of our cassette tape, we'd gladly send you a list. We have more than 350 listed, and you can choose a tape of your choice. You write in form by number or by title. They're gift lift. $3 each, the gift is used to help take care of our, our radio expense. In the book of Job, chapter 38, beginning with verse 1, And the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness counseled by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare it, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sing together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb, when I made the clouds and garments thereof in thick darkness, a swath for it, and break up for it my decree place, and set bars thereto. Now that's as far as I'm reading in this chapter, but I want to call your attention to verse 7. 
when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Keep that text in mind. Now over in the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, you find these words. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. The Bible tells you there that God requires singing, singing by grace, singing spiritual songs, singing unto the Lord. I'm going to speak to you today on this subject, singing in the Bible. Singing in the Bible. You may have never heard a sermon just on the matter of singing in the Bible. And if you follow me closely, then we'll help you from that viewpoint. Did you know for the first 2,500 years after Adam fell in the garden, there was no singing mentioned in the Bible. For 2,500 long years, no singing mentioned in the Word of God. Now you have in the Bible a music director mentioned in the Bible. Now we do know good singing plays a great part in the work of the Lord. And down through the years since God established his church upon the earth, great singing has played a great part in the ministry of the Lord. And in years gone by, great men of God, great evangelists, great pastors and teachers have often had good singers and music directors to help them in the work of God. You know, Dwight L. Moody had Sankey that did a wonderful job. Billy Sunday had Roadheaver and others had great men that played a major part in the work of God in the singing ministry. Now, singing is a ministry, and some people have the ability to direct or lead or sing and to be used to the glory of God. You have a choir master mentioned in the Bible, and 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 22 and 27, and his name is Kenny Nioth. The Bible said he was a chief of the Levites, and he was for song. He instructed about the song because he was skillful. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, and all the Levites that bear the ark and the singers, and Kenanites, the master of the song with the singers. You have that in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 22 and 27. And so you have there the choir minister or the music director that's mentioned in the Word of God. This man was gifted to do this, and, and that was his job to do it. Now I want to mention several places in the Bible where singing is associated with the work of God. Number one, it was associated with redemption. Now you have no place in the Bible to tell you where the angels ever sing. They did not because they were not redeemed by the blood of Christ. In my text in the book of Job, they said there was singing among the stars. And the sons of God shouted with great joy. Now the astrologers and of course the um, astronomers and so forth and scientists and great men of God that studied the heavens and have listened tell you the closer you get up into the heavens among the stars, the more you can detect music among the stars. There's millions of them up there, and they create music up there among the stars. Now, we may never realize that until we pass through there on the way to heaven, but that's been discovered, and the Bible makes mention of the uh, singing among the stars. And I just uh, surmise when you get into the third heaven, you pass the planetary system, then you're really going to hear some music and singing on the other side. Now, you don't find any singing in the Bible until after the redemption of the Israelites whenever they crossed over the Red Sea. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 15, verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this, this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I was singing to the Lord, for he had triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. 
So the Bible tells us here that there were great singing among the Israelites after they were redeemed from the land of Egypt, crossing over the Red Sea, which is a type of blood and redemption. And they sing about their redemption. And if those people sing about their redemption, about the crossing over the Red Sea, how much more should we sing after the shedding of the blood of Christ? If the Red Sea was only symbolic of the blood of Christ, and leaving the land of Egypt and going into toward the promised land gave them a song, how much more should we sing about the things of God since we've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb? Billy Sunday, that great evangelist that turned over a million people into the family of God by his great ministry, was a baseball player. One day on the outside of the ballpark, he heard some Christians singing. And that singing touched his heart. And so when that singing touched his heart, he couldn't get away from it. And he began to listen and cry around. And that resulted in Billy Sunday getting saved. And God used the singing and the music to attract his attention. And he came to God and he led hundreds of thousands of people to God as a great evangelist in America in years gone by. So singing is associated with redemption. And we have much to sing about today since we've been redeemed by his precious blood. Not only that singing is associated with the joy of sins forgiven. If anybody has a right to sing, it ought to be Christian people whose sins have been pardoned, whose sins have been forgiven. Now good music and good singing last and live on and is used of God. Trashy singing and a lot of this junk today you hear on radio and TV, it soon passes away because it's not of God. God had nothing to do with it. It's of the world and much of it of Satan, Satan and devils and not of God. But real good singing and good music last. Trashy stuff pass away. This contemporary singing today among so-called gospel singers is not of God. That's not of the book. And God will never bless it and God will never use that kind of singing. You can't beat the good old fashioned hymns and good old songs that carry a message. You just can't beat it because you can't prove upon it. That's God's way and God's plan. In Psalms chapter 32 verses 1, 2, and 7, the Bible says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man upon whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And whose spirit there is no guile, and thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with a song of deliverance. Now here he's talking about the song of deliverance. And then God delivering him out of uh, the pit, so to speak. He had something to sing about. It should make you happy to know your sins are all forgiven and gone. Now whenever you sing, then surely you're thinking about what Jesus did for you, your sins are gone. I reminded the dear black man back in the days of slavery. He became a Christian. He loved God. And he'd read his Bible and he'd pray and then he would sing. His master got tired of it and said, I'm going to stop him. I'm not going to listen to that. And I'll just uh, take away the Bible from him and his songbook. And, and that'll uh, take care of him. So the slave owner, the master, took the, his Bible and his songbook, and he went out one day into the corn crib to shuck the shucks off for corn. And while he was in the corn crib, he found an old geography book. And he began to thumb through that book. He saw in there that there's a place in the sea where there's no bottom. He studied about that a moment, and then he started singing and praising God, rejoicing. His master heard him and went out to see what was going on because he knew he had taken away his Bible and his songbook. And he said to him, what are you doing? You don't have your Bible, you don't have your songbook. I meant for you to shut up your singing and praising God. He said, master, sir, I know, I know. But said, I read here in this geography book where there's a place in the sea there's no bottom. And said, praise God, the Bible says my sins are in the bottom of the sea and there's no bottom there. And I know they're gone forever. And he started shouting again. 
So you can't beat that. We have much to be shouting about in these days as we serve God is singing about and praising God about. Number three, singing is associated with consecration. Now when Solomon consecrated the temple, they did some singing. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13, it came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praise and thanking the Lord. And when they lift up their voice with the trumpet and cymbal and instruments of music, and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with cloud, even the house of the Lord. Now the Bible tells you here when they were in harmony, when they were together, when they began to praise God, when they began to sing, then God's presence was there and they felt the presence of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 30, verse 21, the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. So here they used instruments, loud instruments, and played those instruments and sing loudly unto God. Because they had great union and rejoicing then, praising God in unity among the people. And this came because of consecration. They had consecrated themselves to the Lord and God's presence came. And they rejoice and praise God about that. Then again, it's associated with union with Christ. In the uh, Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, The Song of, of Songs, which is Solomon's, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. And that pictures us loving Jesus. We're one with him and we're his bride. And here we see... Uh, in the Song of Solomon, uh, Solomon's songs, they wrote many songs, and there it's connected with union with Christ. And when you realize that you're united with Him, that you're in His body, you're part of Him, and you're the bride and He's the bridegroom, that ought to give you something to sing about. Christians ought to sing more than they sing today. You ought to sing in your home, you should sing on your job. You should sing uh, as you're about the house or on the way to church, on the way home. You ought to sing and not listen to much of this trash and junk today that's called music, which is out of the pit. You know, those old uh, beetle bugs that came over here from England years ago and brought demonism with them when they came and stirred up our young people and out of that came these hippies and long-haired filthy people you still see them today they think they got to have their hair hanging down their back and look filthy in order to try to sing and make what they call music which is not music just make a lot of noise and this of course tends toward uh, taking dope and things of that type and our young people in America has never been the same since those Beatles came over here from England and certain groups in America begin to spring up and it's wrecked our youth today. This hard rock stuff today they call music beating and banging and jumping around and looking like uh, a bunch of heathen and dressed like a bunch of heathen. You think God's got anything to do with that? No, that's uh, demonism. And it's really hurt our young people today. And that's why you have so many young people on dope today and out here in the world they look at that stuff and children today spend four hours a day on the average looking at TV and they look at all kind of evil and cursing. You can't hardly turn the TV on today with some program without here. Somebody saying, uh, uh, who in the hell did this, or hell this, and hell that, and, and so forth and so on. And using such language as that, they're trying to approach the place where it can come right out blank to blank and use God's name in vain and get by with it. And they'll eventually do that. It's not fit. By people listen to no respect for decent people Christian people children or what not and that's pathetic getting worse all the time and you ought to praise God and sing good songs and sing a uh, good Christian songs and and you Christians especially ought to sing Christian songs in your home my mother left a great impression upon me when as just a little boy when she'd be cleaning up the house She'd start singing songs all about the promised land. 
A land is fairer than day and things of that type, old fashioned songs and they stuck with me and I appreciate them. We move on further in associating with great persecution. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praise unto God, and the prisoners heard them. In Job chapter 35, verse 10, but none saith, Where is thy God who maketh, who giveth a song, a songs in the night? Now, the more you're persecuted, the more your friends turn against you, the tougher your luck may seem, the biggest problems you may have should cause you to sing more than ever before. Try to sing through your problems and your trouble and your heartaches and your disappointments and you'll find they will let up. Now, if you walk around feeling sorry for yourself and your head hanging down and you feel like everything's happened to you and it's wrong and, and people looking down on you and you have no friends and everything is going wrong, as long as you act like that and look like that, it's going to get worse for you. But if you lift your head and begin to sing and begin to praise God and rejoice, then things will get better for you. We find that happened to Paul and Silas. They went a dirty stink in jail. Their foot said, feet in the stocks and their hands bound up. And, and there they were waiting what uh, some thought was, was going to put them to death. And at midnight, the Bible said they began to sing and praise God. And they sang in the praise the Lord there at midnight. And great joy and great thrill and power came when they began to praise God. You know, every singer, every special singer, every music director should get every bit of this message I'm bringing today. Because it's biblical and should be encouraging and, and should help the people and help singers and quartets and musicians and music directions. Uh, directors, and you listen to it, and you hear it. If you let the devil cheat you out of it, then it's your fault. Because this is for you to, as singers and musicians and choir singers and whatnot to encourage you and help you and let you know where you stand before God in this responsibility. And so when things get rough, rough the Bible says that they sing. In Job chapter 35, verse 10, but none saith, Where is God thy master? who giveth a song in the night. And they sing and they praise God because they were in the darkness of night in, the, in that terrible jail. Not only that singing is connected and associated with fellowship. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. This is where the Holy Spirit commands of the Christians to sing and to praise God and have a song in your heart. And he said, sing the Psalms. That's the Psalms of David in the Old Testament and others that wrote them. And sing the hymns. Christian people need to sing hymns. Make much of the old-fashioned hymns. As I said earlier, this contemporary so-called singing today is not of God. Never be blessed of God, never be used of God, and should not be used in fundamental Bible-believing churches. You need the old hymns, the old songs, songs of the message, songs that help people, songs the Holy Ghost can use to convict people. And so the Bible said here you need to use the psalms and hymns. Not only that singing songs, spiritual songs, with grace in your heart to the Lord. That's like the uh, Blessed Hope singers sing here this morning. There you have your spiritual songs. They're scriptural. They're, you need to sing them. You need them as well as uh, duets and solos. But you need the old-fashioned hymns and old-fashioned singing. They live on. These old songs that you have today, the old rugged cross, amazing grace. My, how God's used them over the years, and they'll be here when all this other stuff, this contemporary stuff is gone and lost forever. These old hymns will be around and to be around when Jesus comes. Now, when you're singing and praising God and rejoicing, there could be no jealousy. There could be no backbiting, no envy, no strife under these circumstances. Somebody said when the devil fell out of heaven, he landed in the middle of the choir. And many churches, you have most of your problems among 
the choir and the special singers and musicians in many churches. You have that. And the devil seems to get into the air in order to, to cause disturbance among the people. But if the choir is singing in the spirit and praising God and singing with grace in their hearts, the special singers, musicians, directors, to have the praise of God in their heart and rejoicing and great love, the devil doesn't have a chance to get in and cause jealousy and ill will and fault finding. But among the singers, as much jealousy, among preachers, as much jealousy, and it should not be. And we shouldn't find fault with God's men and God's singers and God's uh, choirs and men and women that's used of God. We need to pray one for another and have grace in our hearts and sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And if we have that, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, then you're not going to have the uh, jealousy and envy and gossiping and criticizing among singers. Then again, it's associated with singing in heaven. Singing associated with singing in heaven. As I said in the beginning of my message, for the first 25 years, you have no singing mentioned. For the first 2,500 years, 2,500 years from Adam until Moses crossed the Red Sea, you have no singing. You have music, instruments mentioned, but no singing. But after redemption, after the Red Sea, then they began to sing. And from that time until now, you have a song. And it's connected and associated with singing in heaven. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, they sing a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seal thereof. Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue, people and nation. So they're singing the song of redemption yonder in heaven. And we can join in down here since we're redeemed and part of our, our singers over there. And they can sing the songs of redemption there and we can down here. And so singing is associated with singing in heaven. I've heard of men uh, dying on their deathbed said they heard singing. They didn't hear it from the angels. It had to come from the deemed of God because sing, angels don't sing. You don't find where angels sing in the Bible. They have not been redeemed. Or redeemed people sing. Now you in the radio listeners, audience, if you'd like to have this message and this uh, the singing today is on tape number six, number 362. Tape number 362, speaking on the subject, singing in the Bible. Write in and get this tape. It'll help you. Be a blessing to you. Some of you having problems out there among your singers and your choir. Uh, you need to get this tape. Uh, it'll help you. The message will help you very much. You need to get it. It's a biblical message. Every singer ought to get this message if possibly can and listen to it. And uh, you need to hear it because it can be helpful. Now you can very easily lose your song. There's a lot of church members today that's lost their song. They used to sing in the choir. They used to sing special numbers. But they lost that song. Now I reckon why they lost that song. They lost that song because that's exactly what the devil wanted them to do. And they played in the hands of the devil and they don't sing anymore. They don't take a part in the choir anymore. They have lost their songs, have listened to the devil, they've been trip, tricked by the world, and they're being robbed. And they'll most certainly have be the loser when they come to the judgment seat of Christ. Every choir member ought to be in the choir singing the songs of God and praising God and trying to be a blessing or you're going to die one of these days. The only thing that's done for God on this earth is what you're doing now. And when you face God to judgment, you're going to be the loser if you have the opportunity to do things for God and you don't do it. Every singer, every choir member ought to be prayed up and filled up, find their place in the choir and sing the glory of God. You don't need somebody to have to drag you in to sing or beg you to come and sing or threaten you to sing. You don't need that. You're back to on God. You're not right with God if it takes that to get you to sing. I don't care who you are. It's like a preacher that won't preach. He's backslid on God. If somebody has to beg him to preach, entice him to preach, he's backslid on God. He's dead wrong. I don't care who he is. You need to do what God would have you to do. You may say, preacher, I can't very well sing. Well, you, we, you have a, a, a music director. They'll teach you in the choir how to sing. All you got to do is come to the choir, and that's his job to teach you to sing. You can sing if you can carry a tune in a bucket. If you can't carry it in your heart, bring it on in a bucket. And sing it anyway. 
and uh, do something for God. Find your place in the house of God where you can serve God and do something for the Lord. But you can very easily lose that song. In Psalms 137, verse 1 through 4, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that waste us required us of mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, they said. Psalms 137, verse 1 through 4. The Israelites, when Nebuchadnezzar cast them into Babylon, they lost their songs. And they just took their harps and hung them on the willow trees. And when those heathen came around and said, Won't you sing us a song? They knew the songs of Zion were beautiful. They said, won't you say, they said, how can we, we over here in this strange land, we're not where our temple is, and, and how can we sing a song that lost their song? And there's some of you people listen to me right now, you know you're saved, you used to sing in the choir, you sing special numbers, maybe play us in the glory of God, and you don't do that no more, you've lost your song. You have lost it. Now, why did you lose it? You can't blame it on God. You can't blame it on anyone else. You blame it on yourself. You don't. You didn't have to lose your song. You lost your song because you listened to the devil and the world and you wanted to lose your song. You're going to be the loser when you come to the judgment seat of Christ as certain as I'm speaking to you. Oh, Sankey was a great singer with Dwight L. Moody. One day he was um, on the um, battlefield and there Sankey was uh, there in his blue uniform. He was a northerner. And he was keeping guard that night. And then while he was keeping guard, a southern soldier saw him and got a bead on him through his gun to shoot him. And about that time, Sankey started singing a beautiful hymn, softly and sweetly sang that hymn. And there that man intended to kill him, dropped his gun and slipped away. Later on, they were taking a boat ride in a southern a city down a southern river. And Sankey was on that boat, and he didn't know that man had done that. And he got up and sang, and he sang the sang song on that ship that he sang that night on the battlefield. And this man was there that intended to shoot him, and came up and told him what he intended to do, but said, when you sang that song, I couldn't shoot you, sir. And that was the same song you sang here on this boat. And they hugged each other, and he said, I appreciate it. By his singing, he lived on. He was singing out in California near the Golden Gate. There's a man there about ready to jump off and commit suicide. And he heard Sankey singing and stepped off of that bridge. He went on and became a decent citizen. Great singing does great things in the work of God. And if you have the ability to do it, it's a great and major ministry. It ought to be done and needs to be done. You have a lot of song leaders that backslide and start preaching. And when their song leaders from God Almighty and God calls them to sing, give them that ability, and they start trying to preach, they backslide on God. They can't do half as much through their preaching as they could have done through helping some preacher and ministering in music and reaching sinners for God and being a blessing. And there's a lot of men trying to preach today that backslid on God from what God called them to do when he called them to be a singer. And that singing is just as important in a sense as that preacher's ministry. And a man needs to realize that if he can do that, and God knows how many preachers backslid and start trying to preach when they do a far better job by singing. Now, I think you're saying Mel, Mel Trotter was saved when he went down the street, and he I won't have time to tell you about how weak he was. He was saved as he heard singing in a rescue mission, went in, heard the preacher, went out and got right with God. Man was on his way to commit suicide many years ago in one of my pastors in Union Point. Going down the highway, he heard them singing, and he came by and stood, sat down in the back of the church. When I gave him an invitation, he came down and got right with God. And he had some poison, strychnine, in his luggage, and he said, I was going down here in the woods to commit suicide. And he said, that, uh, that strychnine's in my luggage. And there's some people here in this church today know about that. They remember that. My deacons went out and looked in the luggage. Sure enough, there was the poison to take his life. But he got saved, and they made up some money, and the deacons did, carried him out and fed him, put him on a bus, sent him back home to his wife and children. He heard the singing as he went down the road. Don't you take the singing of God too lightly. 
That's very important. Don't you be a person who has to be begged and pulled and persuaded and bowed down to and pampered to get you to do what you can do that God's given you a God-given gift. Don't you do that. There's a lot of singers today that's lost their voices, lost their songs, lost it because they played around and God took it away from them. Probably a lot of musicians the same way that you used to handle the music, the music or the, the, mu the instrument or whatnot. Maybe today they have lost touch and God just let them lose out because they just backslid on God and didn't do what God wanted them to do. You need to be careful. You have a talent, don't care what it is. You ought to use that talent to the glory of God. I'll tell you this and I close. In 1929, J.C. Penney was highly unstable. You've heard of J.C. Penney, haven't you? And so he began to worry and became sleepless. He worried to the extreme and contracted the shingles. And he was sent to a hospital. One night he thought he would die and began to write farewell notes to his wife, his son, and his children, his friends. The next morning, while lying on his bed, he heard singing coming from the hospital chapel next door. They were singing, no matter.